I do not feel that the community is in the place that it, it needs to be to kind of replicate and reflect and just project back out the McPherson report, his legacy of what it's done in terms of careers and community and, and stuff around change. So I guess for me, I wanted to ask you who, who is Stephen? I always to say that Stephen is an extrovert. He um, he gives this air that is which he is confident in himself. He knows who he is. Um, he's not somebody who you always have to be saying you must do this or you must do that. He already it's like he already has sussed out what it is. Um, and we've all said from the age of seven he knew where he wanted to do what he wanted to do. And all we did was to encourage him, give him the tools that he needed. Yeah. Um, and because I see education as a root out of everything. Uh, and I'm not saying that for us where we were, yes, it probably, we, we, we were at the beginning of a council, we, so I, I never lived in a council estate as such. So I never lived in a block, so we, all you have is a, and the kids come down. When at one time when we, um, something, we were renting and the landlord did whatever he did. And I did end up in one of those places um, because there's nothing for to do, we needed housing. And Stephen was in this block, which we never had, he always had a garden and everything. And he kept looking out of the window, he wanted to go out and play. So this day I decided, okay, I'm gonna take you down and this is where you're going to be. You stay there and you can stay there and play. And by the time I was up, up on the first floor up, the bus I could have got back up and look out the window. I saw him going across the road. I don't know. Where is he going? He's a child. Mm. And I think I don't know how I got down those stairs so quick. Yeah. Because all I can see him, a car knocking him over or something, it, he's going on to the main road. It, it decided he's gonna take a walk. And so it, as I say, he's always had that um confidence in himself is independent yeah and as a baby he cried a lot yeah but the minute that he could do things for himself that was it what does it mean to you Stephen Lawrence Day and how it it has embraced the nation what does it mean to you what does it mean to I'm quite humbled by it because I just think that the, the effort that people have been putting into um, to for us to achieve what I set out to achieve because yeah. um, I could never, you know, I, I have the dream of things happening. I have the dream and how I, my, my um, foresight and looking forward and what it is I'd like to see happen. Yeah. But I need other people to help me to make it happen. Sure. And I think it's how everybody has stepped up and, you know, selfishly. You know, and want to support and want to. It's like they want to make um, Stephen proud. It, 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 you could see it as that. don't really see what children see because yeah. um, I can remember as my kids were growing up you know we have we you know racial issue wasn't really a problem as yeah. such and you know there's a couple of things may have happened at school that I, had, I need to go to school to talk about where steam was being abused in some way yeah. but it wasn't something that um, it was always in your face I think yeah. it's more in your face now yeah, than um, what it was Back in the 80s, 90s, it, you know, I don't really, in, in the early stage of the 90s, I don't really remember that. 
but um, in Bermondsey where I kind of was to, to be honest and go where I grew up because I remember I feel like the first interaction I had with police was when I went to play a football match in Bermondsey and the police stopped us with some older kids as well and they were like what are you guys doing on this side of of, of of Southern, basically, right. meaning that you wasn't welcome. So that was a shock to me, because I think I was only about 12. And I was like, what do they mean, like, what's going on here? Yeah, like, yeah. To me, they were like, protect and serve. That's how I saw it, like, at them age, I think at that age, I still had dreams of being a police officer. Oh, did you? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> or things like that, because of yeah. just watching things like Police Academy Cop. Mm, like yeah, that, yeah, I mean. yeah. So, but I it's funny, thing. I mean, so I remember I used to read a lot of things in the newspaper around black kids being stopped and thrown back to police van and that's one of the things I spoke to especially Stephen because yeah. he was somebody who was always he was he, he became independent at such a young age yeah. that we um, you know let him go because by the time he was 10 he was getting on a bus to go down to Woolwich yeah. Galassi area which that we lived in and so I used to say to him you know, when you're walking on the street, walk on the opposite side of the vehicle coming towards yeah, yeah. you. You know, you need to be careful when you're out. And he was like, well, mum, I'm not doing anything. Oh, so, yeah, that you know, why should I be, um, be any, anything happening? You know, I'm not doing anything. So, you know, and, you know, I think what it is for me when Stephen died, you know, is like, I said, want to say, I told you so. These yeah. are the things that can happen, yeah, yeah. but you can't because he's yeah. no longer there. Yeah. And so all the, all the fear that you have for them growing up, you know, I, I just imagine. yeah, it was. Because I've become a parent myself now. My son, my oldest son, is 13, and he's my oldest born. And I have that because I was so free, like you said, at 10. I, when I went to secondary school at 11, I was taking a bus from from one borough to another borough. So, um, and that was just normal. But now, I don't know, I think maybe with media and the amount of coverage that we see, yeah, yeah, I've become more yeah. fearful. But also growing up, I think this is one of the reasons I started Reso was that growing up, I remember a lot of people getting robbed for their trainers. I remember going back to school after like a six weeks holiday mm. and the kids that got bullied for not having the new trainers right, and yeah. stuff like that. And there was a lot of peer pressure. And then also I remember a lot of the kids where I grew up started selling drugs just because mum couldn't afford the 120 pound trainers. And she's got like four children we got four siblings we're talking about the best part of 600 pounds is that you all want the same pair of trainers mm -hmm. and they couldn't do it but the local big boy drug dealers whatever you want to call them on the block they yeah, would tell you hold yeah. this and i'll give you 200 pounds so yeah. it became an easy um, yeah yeah to get money. yeah what are we doing for also the community that well, we yeah, were, yeah, we're not we, we're good at sending money back home yeah but what do we do here to make an impact so that's when resale came to me and I just thought like the only thing that I knew I had a lot of that I could make an impact immediately to what I could see was for me was homelessness. That was because a lot of the time when I went to Africa, people said, like, they people poor in England, are you sure? Yeah. Like, there's no poor people in England. <laughs> Doing small things like that for us just makes it worth it because sometimes it is difficult. It is sometimes people see our growth and our transition and they think, oh, I can do that. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely not easy. Definitely not easy. So then you guys are heading up, I guess. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. All right. Okay. See you later. Right. right, let's go for our walk. I'm so, I'm so, I feel really privileged for you to come down today. Um, but beyond that, just, um, just want to say thank you for partnering up with us. Um, it means a lot to me. I joined here um, two years ago this week, actually. So it's right. my two-year anniversary here as a general manager, and. Um, I remember Brixton. <laughs> I remember coming here with my mum, aged six, seven. All right, yeah. Dragging her trolley. <laughs> and the day I told her that I was, you know, I'd been appointed as general manager was a day. I mean, she'd always wanted me to be a nurse, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Families always want once more for their children. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, she took a sense of pride in knowing that, you know, a scheme that she used to walk me through, I'm now. Yeah. Oh, money. yeah. Yes. So there's a sense of pride in that. So over my two years, it's been, it's been my mission to just do more meaningful work. Okay. You know, there's one thing, you know, being a general manager and making sure the tenants are well behaved and our risk assessments are in check. Um, but it's just more important for us to have brands like Resol and collaborations with, you know, foundations yeah. like yourself. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm really, really pleased that we've got this exhibition here. Yes. I'm um, really, really pleased to have it here.
hope that this is the start of a true partnership. Um, Taylor will be able to talk through some of the potential Pope's road work. I think in more detail because I think there, that there are some, some of the work that you'd already historically done could marry up well with that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we've, um, you know, we've got um, an amazing development that um, uh, designed by David Adjay and we've been, you know, figuring out ways that we can really make sure that what gets built here in Brixton is for the benefit of the people in Brixton. And I think, you know, as such a great role model as David Adjay, I think we wanted to come up with a way to try to make that a kind of a career path that is open to open to everyone and um, and specifically trying to train you know the next generation of black architects and um, to make and so that you know it's not just something that exists outside of the Brixton community but that it is here and it is you know for the people here uh, and it sounds like you've you know worked with you know in these uh, you know architecture and education before and so you know, yeah. thought that could be great ways to work together. Yeah, as I said, the whole thing sounds really good and I think because it's in the heart of the community, which is really part of what I see the foundation um, as we work going to the future. Because we, we, we know, we've talked about that we're having the three C's, which you start within education, then you've got the community and then you've got the careers. So what you were talking about having the, um, with David, that sort of really fits in um, into the foundation, what is it that we are trying to do. Because I think for me, it's always been education first. Because I think without, without having that background behind you, it's very difficult. And then within your community, so it's not just in schools, so outside of school gate, as somebody used to say to me about it. So the young people, they're in school, but they're going out into their community. And that relationship, how do they want the community to be? You yeah, know, yeah. you know how they, as they grow up, you know, that what the building looks like. And I think a lot of kids, before I knew anything about architecture, you tend to just walk. You don't notice the building around you. Don't look right. up. You don't see. I remember when I was doing my degree, one of our lecturers used to say, talks about the um, is that people. It's the Peabody Building because it how it shapes. It's on a corner of a street. And now, when I go out, I look for that. Okay, right. okay. I do, and, and I, I see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of how she described um, what it is. Because I presume during the, in the Industrial Revolution, as people move away from um, out in the country and come into towns, mm -hmm. the building that needs to be built for them. And so you, you begin to get a, a lot more about how to design a building. So over, over for me, for over the years, I, know, I didn't understand around architecture. I didn't understand what students need. I worked in a university and I used to hear my colleagues say about the architectural students, how expensive it is for them because of the materials that they need to buy. Mm -hmm. So that sort of gave me a little bit of grounding. So and then talking to the students themselves, and as they go through, you know, their part one, you're just thinking, okay, part one, part two, part three. What do you mean by that? And so they're beginning to explain to me. So over the, over these, I've learned so much about because sometimes they start, they do their first degree, they take a couple of years out, right, and then come back to it again. But it's the placement is always a always a problem for black kids because they, yes. they don't come from the background as their white counterparts, so they don't have those issues, you know, those things. So for black students, it's always been very difficult. So it's building those relationships over the years that I have done with different practices that I can go and say, you know, we've got students here, placement. And, you know, and a lot of time they do, um, they do take them on. Yeah. But that's what our black kids, um, students suffers with. When we talk about foundation, that's the, the base mm. level of how you can build anything. So to have a foundation that is grassroots and is aware of what's going on in terms of culture and society and education and the community, it's, it's pleasing for, for, for me to witness and know that the foundation is going to keep its grassroots element whilst working alongside you know, what we so have to give mm. back to the community and what Adidas want to build a relationship with the foundation as well. It's, it's, it's pleasing for, for me to see it. So for you, for you, I'm hoping that you feel the same. Well, definitely, definitely. I think, um, as I say, seeing, as I was walking through this morning, yeah. and because it was very quiet, yeah. but people are just busy trying to 
set up their store and do the things that they need to do. And they're doing it because it's something, as I say, it's energy that they have, that they have and they want to be here. It's, it's not that they're forced to be here. And having resold where they are, is like they're in a, because you can see it's like a, um, how it's set up, you can go that way, you can go, but they're sort of centered yeah. within that place. So it's bringing everybody together and working with that with Adidas in a way in which, that, in which they are, mm. you can see what it is that um, Moss is trying to do. Yes. He's not, he's not doing it for himself. He's doing it where he can help. Because when you see young people out, I think I was, um, when you sort of travel through London, the kids, young people are out. One of me want to go and say to them, have you tried to go and speak to your parents? Have you tried this? But because how society is, it's very difficult for you to do that now, yeah. you know. And so the grassroots, I mean, so I think that's where, if you look at the, the likes of Bernie Grant and people like that, who was always that is where they, that's where they started from, and they continue to be there because they know the importance of what it is that you can do to support your fellow man to bring up. Yeah. And there's a there's a um, like a statue somewhere that as you're climbing the ladder, you've got to put your hand behind and pull the other person up with you. Lift as you climb. And I, Lift as you climb. I just think that's what I see the foundation be able to do, is, is to be able to help our young people to become whatever they choose to be. Mm -hmm. And without people like the grassroots people, and that's what society is built on the grassroots. Okay, you don't have the big government come in, the government is not giving him trainers to give off to nurses. The government's not doing that. Yeah, it's coming from these individuals. It's coming so from these individuals. And then if you have a big company like Adela saying, well, what can I do to give back? And I think that's what we always want to do is give back. It's amazing. So yeah. thank you to Adidas. A thank well, you. A big thank you to Adidas. And, and the fact that they used to take us on um, to support the foundation, mm. you know, you know, you talk about loads of stuff, but mm. it, it takes somebody like Adidas to say, okay, this is what I can do to help you. And they're giving something back mm. um, within the community. So the foundation is very grateful. And for Resold as well, a massive thank you to and them. For massive, well. um, I mean, so seeing how what Resold is doing and talking to Mas, it's just really good to hear where he was coming from and how he decided to, what, he, what he's doing. And, you know, it, it, I think it's just being here today. As I said, Brixton is not somewhere that I visit. Because I think yes. where, where, you, where I live over in, over in the southeast there, I, I remember saying, I'm, I want to come down, I want to be able to shop down here. Mm -hmm. But because um, Lewisham has always been a place where I've always been, yeah. and Greenwich, so Brixton is so, but seeing here today, I'm, I'm walking around, this is the place I definitely want to come back to. I, I want to spend more time. I'd like to thank um, WPP, um, especially um, Karen Blackett, for the support that she's given. Uh, and it's been fantastic. Um, I think um, the fact that we've had so many people engaging in the short film, um, celebrating Stephen's life and marking what the foundation is doing, so it's a big thank you go out to you and to all those other people behind the scenes we don't always see or hear about them. So for me, um, I'm very grateful and very honoured that you're able to help me. Thank you.